Hello, and thank you for joining in on today's training. Heart and Solutions is a proud provider of CE eligible trainings for our counseling community. This training may be eligible for continuing education credit hours through either the National Board for Certified Counselors, provider number 7376, or the Association of Play Therapy, provider number 21-645. To obtain CE hours for today's training, be sure to follow the steps in the description below to find and take your quiz. Hello, my name is Krista Hunt and I am the Vice President in charge of the BHIS Department at Heart and Solutions. I have been providing BHIS services as well as supervising and training providers since 2012. BHIS stands for Behavioral Health Intervention Services and it is a free service for children with Medicaid insurance in the state of Iowa. We can see children from the ages of 4 through 18 years old and their families. Before starting BHA services, clients will complete an assessment with a licensed mental health therapist. During this assessment, they will discuss what behaviors they are wanting to work on, they will gather information on the child and the family, and they will receive an official DSM mental health diagnosis. Some common diagnoses that we work with in BHA services are ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, and conduct disorders, to name a few. Typically, one to two weeks after the assessment is completed, one of our BHA providers will be able to start working with the family. BHA sessions will usually take place in the client's home after school hours. Sessions can also take place at one of our offices or in school as long as the child's school allows. All of our BHA's providers are trained on several behavior-based interventions, such as utilizing the Seven Seas of Resilience by Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg and Wellness Recovery Action Plans, or RAP, by Mary Ellen Copeland. At their first session, our providers will set treatment plan goals with the family. Some examples of goals that a BHIS client might have would be utilizing coping skills to manage their anger, learning to identify and express their emotions appropriately, utilizing stop and think to improve their impulse control, improving their ability to listen and follow directives, or improving respectful and assertive communication skills. Our BHIS providers will then create and utilize games, crafts, and other hands-on activities to incorporate fun ways for clients to practice these behavioral skills during their weekly sessions. These videos will now show some examples of behavioral health intervention activities that our providers have created to use in session to help our clients work on their treatment plan goals. BHA stands for Behavioral Health Intervention Services. So we can go in home and we work with children ages four to 19 along with their families. We work with behaviors ranging from communication skills, impulse control, listening, following directions, really you name it, we can work on it. And we work through those behaviors by doing fun different activities. Today I'm going to show you an activity that I like to do in session and it's perfect for summertime because I like to have a little treat afterwards also. So it's called an ice cream apology. What you'll need for this activity is just a template offline of an ice cream cone that you can trace or you can draw your own. Um, you'll need four different colors, one for each scoop, so we'll need four different scoops, and then a color for your cone. You'll need scissors, you'll need something to trace and something to write with, and then you'll also need some glue. So we will go ahead and get started. So first we'll cut out our template of our ice cream cone. I usually cut off the cone and the ice cream scoop. So you'll cut those off. So now you got two pieces. And we will go ahead and trace the cone first onto um, whatever color you want your cone to be, whatever color of construction paper. I chose orange. Um, so we'll trace that on quick and then we will cut that out. So I just got it traced real quick. So, once you've got your cone cut out, go ahead and you can trace your scoops. So you'll need four scoops. So go ahead and choose what four, four colors you want to use and then trace it four times. So 
So now we've got our four ice cream scoops and our cone. So we will go ahead and take our glue and we're gonna glue them and stack them one by one. So we'll have a four scoop cone. This is what your ice cream cone should look like once it's all glued up. So it'll be nice and long. Um, and then we're gonna write on each cone. So this is where you'll need to have a marker or something that will show up really good so that we can write on our cone. So on the first one, we're going to write, I am sorry for. Second scoop, we are going to write, it was wrong because. On the third scoop, we write, next time I will. And then on the fourth scoop, the scoop closest to the cone, this bottom scoop, we're going to write, is there anything that I can do? This is what your cone should look like your ice cream cone, I suggest putting it into a place where it's easily accessible, easily seen. But when there is an apology that's needed to be made, the child can go to that ice cream cone, follow those steps, practice, memorize, so that they can make that appropriate apology. Being able to make an appropriate apology is something that's going to follow them through childhood, through school, through adulthood, through their career. Uh, so it's very important to start learning and teaching those things very soon. In BHIS, we go in home. This is just a sample of something that we would practice with younger children. When I do this activity, once it's completed, I like to give the children a reward and have an ice cream cone or a bowl of ice cream, make ice cream sundaes or something at home afterwards, just as a reward for completing the project. Um, we would role play a couple of times to try and get them in the hang of it and to understand the purpose of doing the Apology Ice Cream Cone. So the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to get a couple different colored sheets of construction paper, some yellow, green, blue, and red. And then you'll want to take a marker and draw a circle with it. And then on the inside, you're going to write before you speak. And it'll look like that. And then you'll take your other sheets of paper and you'll need to make five hearts, which are going to be the flower petals. And these don't have to be perfect by any means. And so on the first one, you'll write T equals is it truthful and then you'll cut that one out t is it truthful on the second heart you'll write h equals is it helpful just like that it out another thing to note is that you can use whatever color markers you want i'm just using a black marker, but you can really do whatever and make it however you want. So there's the H, is it helpful? And I'm going to grab a red piece. And then I'm going to do another heart. And on the inside of this one, I'm going to write I, is it interesting? Just like that. And then the next one, and this one is going to be, is it necessary? So it would be N equals, is it necessary? And then the final one is the letter K, so you'll do another heart. And the letter K equals, 
is it kind? I'm gonna cut that one off too. Now you have all your hearts. I'm cutting out the middle circle. And you can also make, if you want, a stem for the flower. I'll go ahead and do that. And then make some leaves too. And this activity is just really good for any kids that are having problems with speaking nicely to others or saying things that are hurtful. And this is just, it's a good reminder of thinking before we speak is what we are saying kind, helpful, necessary, truthful, or is it something that's kind of hurtful? Now that we have all our pieces, we're gonna take a glue stick and glue all our pieces of our flower together. So something that's really cool, or I find really cool about this, is that when you get all of your hearts, all of your flower petals together, it forms the word, think. And again, that stands for, is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is what you're saying interesting? Is it necessary? And is it kind? I just think that's really neat. Again, this is just a really great way to help your kids think about their actions and what they're saying to others and how that might make others feel. And at the end, you'll have your little think flower. So, you know, again, just think before you speak. Today, I'm just gonna be talking through one of my favorite activities to do in BHIS. It's one of my favorites because it's easily adaptable to cover so many different things. Um, but we're gonna be talking about Feelings Jenga. Uh, feelings Jenga is something I use to kind of help define emotions in little kids and like ways to cope with them. It's super simple game because everyone knows Jenga. It just takes a little bit of prep time, but all you need is a Jenga set or like an off-brand Jenga set from like five below or something. And you're just going to write different emotions on some of the blocks. So like here I have goofy or this one says angry. And what you're going to do is just play Jenga like normal with the kids, except when they pull a block, um, depending on how old they are, you can do a couple of different things with the emotion on that block. So for like little kids um, who I just wanna expand their kind of emotional vernacular, I would just have them explain what the emotion means. Um, so like if we had angry, I'd be like, what does angry mean? Or if we didn't wanna go that route, I would ask them to make an angry face. Um, again, it's easy to adapt to other developmental stages. So if your kiddos are a little bit beyond that, you could say, okay, where in your body do you feel angry? Like does maybe your stomach gets tight or your hands clench? Um, and then for older kids, if they want something a little more complex, you can ask them to explain a time in their lives where they felt really angry or how they cope with feeling angry. So this is one of my favorite things, again, because you can adapt it to different developmental stages or change the prompt, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, the activity we're doing today is like a DIY lava lamp. Um, this can be used with all household ingredients and can be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, one of the biggest ones I like to use it for is showing um, emotions, how they can bubble up and kind of explode to kind of get kids to kind of understand what's happening in their body. But it can also be used as an activity to kind of get to know people, um, have stronger trust with each other. Um, you can also put it in a sealed container and use it as a sensory bottle, uh, like a water bottle or a mason jar. Um, they can see like the oil and water that we're going to use interact. Um, so what you'll need is some oil. I've got just vegetable oil here, some food coloring and water, and then some like Alka-Seltzer or antacid tablets. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll want about three fourths, two thirds water um, or vegetable oil, and then you'll add water to it. So you'll want more oil than water. That much. So you can see how the water has settled to the bottom, oil on top. And you're gonna add your food coloring. I'm using red today. Red can be really good to show kind of what anger looks like. Um, a lot of people associate red with anger. Um, 
but you can do it with different emotions. Um, put about seven drops in there, eight. Um, and then you just drop in your Alka-Seltzer tablets. Watch it work, and then the color will start to mix in there. And then it looks just a little bit like a lava lamp. And like I said, you can use this to kind of explain um, what emotions are doing, especially in younger children who don't really understand what their body is doing. This can be a physical representation of it, or it's a really good sensory activity if you have kids that um, like to have, like to focus on something else when they're doing something. So it's quiet, um, they can shake up the bottle and see the water and oil interact. Um, or just a good bonding experience with kids to get to know them a little bit better. My activity today is a pretty simple activity. It doesn't require a lot of materials. It doesn't require a lot of commitment, pick up, anything like that. What you would need is a simple piece of paper and markers, colored pens, colored pencils, anything that's colorful. Um, so what I tell my client to do is to get the black marker first and draw on their piece of paper what it would look like to them when they are overstimulated, when they are frustrated, when they're not able to put into words how they feel because their mind is just going too fast. Just their mind is just racing. There's too much to do, not enough time to do it. So this activity is great for that. Um, on the piece of paper, the scribble that they're gonna end up drawing looks a little chaotic as it should, because that's usually how they feel when they're overstimulated. Um, so here's an example of what a scribble might look like. And in each of these little spaces is where you would draw a pattern or a color, or uh, you could draw a symbol, you could do any type of thing to fill those voids to match whatever the client might be feeling at that time. Um, a lot of times we have been doing just colors because my clients are maybe too young to understand patterns. So you can adapt it for younger clients and just do different colors. You could do the colors of the rainbow. You could do um, every other color, kind of a pattern like that. Or with cl uh, older clients, you can adapt it and you can do patterns such as lines like this. And you can kind of turn it into maybe like a competition if you have some clients that like that healthy uh, competition you can see how many um, how many patterns you can get who can get the most patterns who can get the ones that nobody else can think of you know you can turn it into kind of a, a game that way um, this is also a good way to check in with your client about how they have been doing since your last session it's a great way to, you know, practice your active listening skills, um, go over some of the things that maybe aren't the, the fun things of the session, the, the fun parts, but it's an intervention you can use to kind of get some of the, the not so fun answers that you need from your clients, you know, how, they're, how they've been doing since you last saw them, how, um, how they've been feeling, how have things been going, so... Um, just a great activity to slow down your brain, slow down your body, um, socialize, and not have to go out and buy any new supplies and have more stuff in the back of your trunk. So today we are going to be doing a circle of control activity. Um, and for this activity, you just need a plain piece of paper, or you can use colored. And I'm using a box of crayons to draw on this, but you can use markers, pens, a pencil, whatever you have around the house. Um, there are a few different ways that we can do this one. 
whether that be drawing a picture of a hand or having a visual. So if you have a jump rope or a string, you can make a circle and you can have different cutouts that you can put in that of situations that kids can control versus what they can't control. But for this one today, we're gonna to take our crayons and draw a circle on our piece of paper. So there is my circle and it is not perfect, but that's okay because sometimes things don't go perfectly according to plan. And that's something that you can also talk about with the kids when we're working together. So inside the circle, I write in our control, and it's kind of hard to read on here. Um, and then outside of the circle, we say out of our control. And it can look something like that. So when we do this activity, um, I'll have the kids talk about some things that they think they can control versus what they don't think they can control. And it's kind of interesting to see um, and different kids of different ages will might have a little bit difficult time doing this because some of that, when they hear out of control, they might think that they're just being crazy or they might think they have a lot of energy versus things that they literally don't have any control over. So for things that are in our control, we could say somewhat our emotions or at least how we respond to our emotions. Um, and when talking to kids about this, um, a lot of times we find that emotions are a big one that cause frustration and things that aren't in our control also cause frustration because they're not in our control. So we don't know what's gonna happen with them. And some of those elements of unknown are what cause a lot of stress for kids. So in our control, we could say emotion, we could say words that we say to other kids. Out of our control, you might get things such as family or mom and dad. And that one's a big one as well because some kids wish that they were in control of the family. And when mom or dad tells them to do something, that makes it extra frustrating for them. So we have this way that we can do that and kind of this visual of just Having that circle, it can kind of help kids see that, oh, these are in my circle of control versus all these words out here are kind of things that I can't. So also out of our control might be going to school, which is a good thing to talk to kids about as we're coming back to the school year. And I know a lot of them have frustrations about having to go to school, they don't find anything fun in school. So it's kind of just a simple activity um, and it's a good way to just have a visual for kids to see like things that we can control and talk about some of those frustrations and why it's frustrating that we can't control them um, versus when we can control things, like how do we respond? What are our actions? What might we say to others that can be kind or hurtful? I have an activity planned for us today. Um, it's called My Daily Affirmations. This activity will help clients with self-esteem self and building confidence to rewire the way that we think about ourselves from negative to positive self-talk. The materials you'll need today are con whoop, construction paper, markers, glue, and then a mirror I got at Dollar Tree. Um, you, if you don't have that, you can also use a picture of yourself as well. And then decorations. So I have um, foam stickers to decorate when I'm done as well. So to start off, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna glue my mirror down onto my construction paper, like so and put it in kind of the top corner. And then I'm going to label my 
thing as my daily affirmations. So this is what it looks like to start off. Okay. So now we're going to come up with five to ten affirmations depending on um, how old your client is. Um, I'm going to do ten today. So the first one I have is I am a good mother. My second one is I am intelligent and focused. My third affirmation will be I am always honest. and responsible for my actions. My fourth affirmation will be I am loved and have an incredible support system. My fifth affirmation will be I am allowed to make mistakes and brave for trying new things. My sixth affirmation will be, I am curious to learn more about myself and constantly evolve evolving into a better person. My seventh affirmation will be, I am creative, strong, and powerful. My eighth affirmation will be, I am hopeful for the future. My ninth affirmation will be, I am a great listener and enjoy helping others. My last affirmation will be, I am freeing myself from all destructive thoughts 
doubts and fears, I can do anything I set my mind to. Okay. So, so far it looks like this with the mirror up top and then all my affirmations underneath. The next step is to decorate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take my stickers um, and place them all around just to make it more for me. So this is what the final product looks like and now um, you're going to want to post these either in your bedroom or your bathroom and these are something that you should practice every day uh, to help you um, rewire the way that we think about ourselves um, and to uh, build confidence and um, your self-esteem. Um, this is one of my favorite activities. It's about um, ang not angry responses and then non angry responses. So it's actually a little worksheet just to like provide a visual. And it's called how do I respond. So there's an example already on here that kind of helps get it going. So the first situation that we're going to come up with our responses is I can't figure something out. So the point of this is we're going to talk about what are angry responses, probably something that we shouldn't do, but sometimes we do respond that way because we get mad and we don't know how to control our emotions so much yet. So our angry response is going to be, I break my pencil and yell. That's the response example on the worksheet. So then we're going to talk about what would be our non angry response. What would be um, our good response, something that we can do instead. And the example says, I ask for help. So I can't figure something out. Our non-angry response is, instead of getting mad and breaking our pencil and yelling, is asking for help. So then our, um, our next situation, and this is where me and the client will brainstorm, says, my sibling and I fight. So then we think, okay, what would be our angry response? What would be something that we shouldn't do, but we may do because we get really angry? And a lot of times I get, I hit, I yell, um, you know, I just keep bugging them and stuff like that. So we'll write that down. We're like, okay, that's our angry response. But then we think, okay, what can we do that would be better um, with our non-angry response? Like what could we do instead? And so we brainstorm things that we can do instead, which would be like, go to a separate room, um, maybe hug it out apologize, let it go, those kinds of things. So then we just go through the whole worksheet. There's a whole bunch of different examples on here of things that we'll brainstorm. And then if there's even like situations that I know of or things that are also coming up in their lives, we can add them down here. And so when I do this, I like to do it with a bunch of like different fun colors and stuff. So I'll usually do um, red on the angry responses and then like a, I'll let them pick their happy color. And that's what we'll write the, the non anger responses out. And so we'll just brainstorm those things and try to work on coping with our anger and better ways to handle situations. Hi guys, so today I am going to go over the gingerbread technique with you. Um, I have a piece of paper and a marker here. Um, I'm just gonna draw a gingerbread man. I'm sure most of us know what a gingerbread man looks like, but if we don't, I'll show you here in a minute. So really, ultimately, when making the gingerbread man, you're usually going to have the child make it. I'm not the best drawer in the world, so I'm sorry if this looks kind of different, but there's a gingerbread man. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take three markers and the child is the one who will decide on what colors they're going to use and what, um, 
what emotion that it represents or feeling both. Um, so I'm going to choose red and I'm going to make that one anger slash mad. And these are ones that younger kids typically pick. Um, this is the emotions that they tend to identify with the most. Um, and then I have blue for sad. And then for myself, I'm going to use purple for happy. So then what you're going to do is ask the child to color in um, where they feel mad or their anger. So I'm going to go ahead and do that one first. And I'm just pretending to be what a child might usually put. And then I am going to put color in where I feel happy. And then I'm going to have them color in where they might feel sad. So typically, a lot of times when I do this with clients, this is how their um, gingerbread man ends up turning out. We have anger, which on mine I put on the arms and legs. Um, I see this one a lot. Typically, that's where they take their anger out, like kicking and hitting happy in their heart because that's where they feel happy um sad in their head because that's sometimes where we get our sad thoughts or we cry um so this is something that i usually see a lot and it helps kind of identify like why they might be kicking or hitting and i really like that because then i can help work on those with the kids um so that's it um another thing that i've kind of thought about this recently would be Actually, you could cook gingerbread men and um, take icing, colored icing, and have them icing that in on the gingerbread man. Um, I think that's something that would be cool and a little bit more interactive. Today, I'd love to show you an activity I do with almost all of my clients, um, and it's teaching clients a little bit more about how their brain works and emotional regulation. So to start, I tell them to Put up a hand just like this and put their thumb across their palm and then put your fingers over your thumb and then I explain to them this is a hand model of their brain. I'll tell them that when you're born your brain develops from the bottom up so the first part to develop is this part which is the brain stem and the brain stem controls um, mostly reactive things um, like um, breathing and eating and circulation and all that. As you get older, the next part to develop is called the limbic system. So this is represented by your thumb. Your limbic system is kind of your fight or flight mode of your brain. A lot of people will sometimes call it the lizard brain because it's very reactive, right? If you've ever put your hand on a hot stove and you pull it off, that is just your, your brain reacting. You're not really thinking, oh, Oh, I should pull my hand off the stove. You just do it. And that's a really important part of our brain. Then the next part to develop is the cortex. And the cortex is also called the upstairs brain. And the part of the cortex is, it's kind of like our wise brain. It will help us think through emotions and it uses emotions and logic to make some decisions. So when we're functioning as our brain should, our our um, upper brain and our limbic system are talking to each other. Right? We might be able to say, oh, I'm feeling really, really afraid or nervous right now. I want to go run away. Um, let's say you're having a test coming up and your upper brain might talk to your limbic system and say, oh, but you studied really hard for this test. You're going to do really well. There's nothing to run away from. And then we will take our test. But sometimes when we feel really strong emotions, our lid flips. And at this point, a lot of my clients love to practice flipping their lid. So I'll we'll say, pretend that you are feeling really strong emotion and you flip your lid. 
Uh oh, now your upper brain, your cortex is no longer talking to your limbic system and your limbic system is doing all the thinking. All right, and so when the limbic system is doing all your thinking, you're not really able to make the best decision. So if you ever have had a sibling or know someone that is like a toddler and they have like temper tantrums and that sort of thing, they're usually thinking with their limbic system. And we want to make sure we have that under control. And so I tell them, one of the biggest ways to help us not flip our lids so we can think in our most wise mind and be in the most control is by naming our emotions. We have the little catchphrase, name it to tame it. So in order to start learning how to name our emotions, I will then give clients a map of their bodies and I will have them color in with different colors representing their different emotions and that's just a really good way to um, to start even talking about emotions um, like for example anger what color do you think anger should be Ooh, a lot of people think it's red yeah tell me more about that what do you think anger is red and then we'll say where do you feel anger in your body um, and really digging into oh I, I wonder why you feel that so I'll show you a really quick map um, that I made of my own with some clients actually and I put uh, I felt anger in my fists sometimes I notice my hands are getting really tight um, I feel anger kind of up here my chest will kind of feel like it's getting tighter um, my forehead sometimes will get warm so those are all signs to me oh I'm getting angry and I can name that then before I get so angry that I can't control it anymore. I can say, oh, I'm getting angry. I might then talk about different coping skills that we can use. Oh, I notice I'm getting angry. I'm feeling my fists clench up. What can I do that's going to help me stay in my wise mind? Oh, I might choose to play with a fidget. I might choose to go on a walk. I might choose to go push against a wall or something like that, and we'll brainstorm coping skills. Um, and that is the activity that I have taught a lot of uh, my clients, and I hope that it can be helpful for anyone watching this as well. I can send a link to um, a little chart that I use as a handout for my clients whenever we go over this so they have that resource and also a link for a video online that I will sometimes show my clients as well. That's more engaging than me doing it. Um, all right, I hope this is helpful, thank you. Today I'm gonna to show you an activity that I like to do with the kids that I meet with. So for starters, when I get there, we kind of talk about feelings and emotions and I'll show them the monsters and be like how do you think this monster feels and they'll give me different emotions and feelings and we'll talk about how each of those correlate to the picture i will then ask the child to draw their own emotions like how do you look when you're mad how do you look when you're sad how do you look when you're happy we will then discuss triggers and coping skills and i have another sheet for that so they just write down things that trigger them and then ways they can cope, different coping skills, anything to assist them in calming down and de-escalating the situation. Oh, so we go over those stuff, that stuff a lot with children. And I've had guardians bring up concerns to me regarding the fact that their child knows all these coping skills, but they don't know when or how to actually implement them when situations arise. So I've came up with another activity that I think is awesome. And I think it really, um, it makes the child accountable for their emotions and how they react to those emotions. And it's called the emotions box. So here's mine. It's Heather's emotions box and I have different faces and different, you know, emotions or feelings related to those faces. And on the flip side, I have coping skills of uh, little pictures and words, but breathing techniques, reading music, whatever the kid wants on their box. They can put on their box, even if it's their favorite animal. You know, I want the box to be as personalized as possible and unique to them. You could also use hot glue guns, stickers, anything. It's very versatile. 
Well, so I ask that the kids use this box at least once or twice a week. And I created a slip. So when they have a behavior, I ask that they fill out the slip at least twice a week to start out with, maybe more. You know, if a child's having behaviors multiple, multiple times a day, it's kind of unrealistic to ask them to fill it out every single time. So I ask for starters just like twice a week, and then maybe we can move up and do more. But so this just asks, what happened? How did you feel? How did you react? What coping skills did you use? Did the coping skills work? Yes or no? And then I also ask them to draw their face of how they felt. I also give the guardians punch cards. So every time that the kid fills out a paper and uses their emotions box, the guardian would then initial a box. And this can be used for positive reinforcement, incentives, all that good stuff. So once the child gets to five or ten, whatever the guardian sees fit, the child would then get an incentive, whether that be an ice cream cone, ten minutes extra of screen time, ten minutes extended on their bedtime, whatever the guardian wants to use to, you know, as a positive reinforcement. And the activity today that I have for you guys is called, I guess we'll call it coin memory. And this is pretty simple. We have two sheets of paper. Um, it doesn't have to be two, but it can be. Um, you can just use like whatever the floor, the table that you're on. But we're gonna do is grab four or five coins. And with those, um, we put them in any order. It doesn't have to be specific, but depending on the, the child that you have, um, obviously you wanna make it harder or easier, you can with the coins or the kind of coins they are. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So we'll take this off. This is the order that we have. And um, it's here. We give the kids 30 seconds to a minute to observe the coins and try to remember the order they're in. Maybe even try to come up with a strategy to be able to, you know, remember the coins. So then we do that and we put the other sheet of paper and sometimes it's a couple, whatever it is to where you can't see the coins underneath of the colors or the, the lumps under it. Um, and then we try to duplicate that same thing. So I believe we had Penny, Penny, I believe it was a dime, quarter, dime. And then we can slide it over. And I believe we had it. Yes, we did. So that's that's um one way one activity and you can duplicate that a, f a few times um i do that as either like icebreaker games or at the end of the session um and it really does like i've seen a lot of um success with that because it just helps them focus um and i it's i've done this with children with um adhd add um trouble just like you know keeping their hands and feet to themselves because it's the coins are like oh i want to touch it it's exciting so yeah um, I would recommend doing that at the beginning or the end, or you can just implement it in the middle of your session. Some, you know, no children are all the same. So we, we got to be flexible and have a bunch of activities. Today, I'm going to be showing you a video about an activity that I like to do with my clients. Um, it's a really fun activity. I've noticed for an opening kind of get to know you activity, and it touches on different skills such as listening, following directions, focusing, and task completion. So it's a really good get to know you activity that you could really do with any client. Um, I found it especially helpful for kids with ADHD. And this is kind of how we started off. So for the scavenger hunt, you really don't need any materials for this except for um, the materials and objects and items that you find in clients' homes. Before I start the scavenger hunt activity, I always give my clients expectations that um, come with this activity and then I have them echo it after me. So for the scavenger hunt activity, I just remind them that whenever they're sharing, I'm listening and what that looks, sounds, and feels like when you listen. And the other expectation is that once you find the object, that you go and put it back exactly where you found it. With this activity, you can really do it with any age group. You can tier it and scaffold it how you want it to. You can change it to where it would be useful to do um, chores as well. Um, but for the purpose of this video, we'll just keep it as something that you might consider doing for a get to know you activity. 
with a new client. So with the scavenger hunts for my younger clients, what I did with this one is that we started off by saying a phrase, kind of a words of affirmation. And I had my client repeat after me, I would have them say, I can do hard things to remember that they can do hard things. They would echo it because for some clients, it's very hard for them once we start something to finish that task that involves putting the item away or cleaning up. So that's just what I incorporated into this activity and you could just have them echo it. I have it on slides, but again, you can do all of this um, verbally. You don't need to have it digital, but if you think that that would help your client by having something visual, you all could incorporate an art piece and then find your own affirmation and create it together physically. So the first thing that I have is to find something green in your house. So I would have that client go and find something green. And again, you can change it and make it your own however you want to. I focused on color for this one first, and they would find a green object and explain it to me. This activity also works great if you have siblings or there are other people in the house that you would like to bring together into the activity. And then I have that reminder again of the affirmation, I can do hard things, have the client repeat it, and then the reminder again of the direction of putting it away where you found it. Then I would have something like find something you like to eat. And so the client would find something, tell me about um, why they enjoy this treat or this snack. And then again, the repetition of after we do that, after they share, they'll repeat the affirmation of I can do hard things and then remembering to put it away exactly where they found it. And then you could have them find something that was their favorite thing in their house and explain to you why it's their favorite thing. After they've shared, they would again repeat the affirmation and put it away exactly where they found it. Um, and so at the end, I would explain to them why we did the scavenger hunt and remind them of their affirmation, I can do hard things. So when they need to focus and finish something like we did together with our scavenger hunt, that's something they could do as well on their own. And that's my activity that I have. It's very easy, it's simple. You really don't need any materials to do this. You can create materials together if you would like um, with paper and markers or whatever art supplies that you would like to do. but. It's, it's a pretty simple, fun one. What I'm gonna show you guys is an activity I like to do with some of my clients. Essentially, I have them look through a kaleidoscope and draw what they see. Uh, I think it's helpful for them to have something that's moving and out of their control and have them practice being patient and calm with the changing image and trying their best to cut, like, I guess, uh, copy what they see. Um, I also like to have them talk about how they feel about certain colors during it, what certain images, images in kaleidoscope evoke. Uh, so the only need is a kaleidoscope. I have this one that I bought online for five dollars. Sheet paper. I like having a color, uh, a colorful paper base, just because it makes it more interesting, and the kaleidoscope reflects whatever color you're looking at. So if I was to be looking at an orange or pink wall. The background would be the same color as the paper. It's never really like a white background. And then color pencils. I have a very large pack here, but usually any set of a sort, like even a smaller set of color pencils has uh, enough colors for it. My uh, my kaleidoscope has purple, red, blue, orange, green. So very sim simple colors, nothing crazy. All right, so basically I have them look through the kaleidoscope, find a picture they like. So I'm going to find one that I'm fond of. I'll show this one. Hopefully I can show it on camera. I'll see if that works. Yep, okay. So that's the image I'm going to try to draw. Uh, you have to be very careful if you don't want it to move around. And I'm going to start with a light blue color because that's what I saw and start with the main shape which is a hexagon. Uh, I find that this is a challenging activity especially for those uh, clients that have trouble finishing tasks. But it's good practice because the end result is so beautiful and when they see it, they feel like, okay, it's well worth my time and effort to, to try and, and do this as well as I can. So it's a little bit of a lengthier as, uh, process as well, which makes it all the more difficult. Um, but yes, I'll just apply it while I do some work on this. Alright, so here's a really 
quick and sloppy uh, version of what I saw inside. As you can see, kind of makes the shapes, shows it. I think if you have older kids, uh, you can have them change the kaleidoscope again on purpose, hold it really still, and try to create a pattern with a bunch of different hexagons that make different, that have different colors on them. It ends up looking like stained glass. And uh, I think it's great for them. If you have younger uh, clients or your own kid that you know, might might not have a full grasp of what you're asking them to do. I think just letting them look and draw what they see is good. Sometimes they draw random shapes completely, like out of the blue. Uh, it seems like they're just you know different locations. Other times they manage to draw one, and then they feel like that was really hard for them. Uh, but I think it's useful. Uh, also, speaking of this one, I think it reminds me of some type of uh, I'd say peace and poise. Uh, the colors I think to me evoke some type of maturity of mind um, makes me feel like I want to read outside but maybe sitting on like, a nice lawn chair rather than an on a picnic blanket I don't know if that makes any sense so uh, having them discuss the colors and what the images evoke is pretty good I think practice for them so I'll add a picture of what it looks like when it's finished at the end of this and it, again it'll be not perfect it's not meant to be perfect so What I'm going to show you today is an activity that I've actually used with a couple of different families, which is chalk paint. Um, this is also a great activity to do outside, which I have not done yet, but now that it's starting to get nicer, um, perfect opportunity to on the sidewalk or driveway, um, as well as using construction paper when it's not so nice out. The materials that you will need are flour, water, food coloring, a measuring cup, dice, a spatula, a 16 ounce squeezable bottle, and a mixing bowl. I have found that this activity really helps create a bond with kids and the guardians. Um, the point of the activity is to have the guardian and kids create a story together with the chalk paint and at the end we discuss the narrative and what ultimately led to the decisions to create the ending. Um, how it works is that by just mixing all the materials together first, well first you do the flour and then the water and then we add the food coloring. It's important to have each person participating to have their own color or bottle so we kind of know what was added um, in case people do forget what that was added to their narrative or story um, by having different colors kind of help separate that. Next we would roll a dice to see who would start the story. Um, once the first person is done, I have the next person start and add to the story and we continue to go around um, in a circle for 30 seconds. I have each of them in I have each of them then go back and forth until an ending is created. At the end, I dive into what led to the decisions to add certain aspects of the story and how we ultimately reach the conclusion of the story. So now I'm going to kind of show you um, how to complete the activity on construction paper since I will not um, be doing it outside for today. Um, but this is what it should look like in your 16 ounce squeezable bottle. So for today, I'm going to just show you a quick demonstration of what it should just look like. So I am going to draw a flower. That way you have an idea of what the paint should look like on construction paper or on the sidewalk or driveway. So you guys might know what I'm talking about when I say that I found these in my grandma's basement and these are melting beads, fuse beads, or otherwise called perler beads. Um, my clients so far have loved these and keep asking me to bring them back and while it's not an emotional regulation activity or anything like that, I feel that it's beneficial for clients that um, struggle with attention to task or ADHD um, because it does require kind of some tedious efforts and I don't know where they are but I have little tweezers that go along with these so for for kids they can pick up these little beads with their little hands but for me, 
I need the tweezers that allow me to put it on to these little templates of, I, I have so many, I have a turtle, I have a kid, and then I also have this one where you can kind of create whatever you want. Um, and so it would take me way too long to try to create one in front of you guys, but I do have, oh, so I have this, this is the paper that it came with. And then once you're done, you place it over the template like that with the beads on it. And then you iron it on. I don't know if this is ringing a bell to anybody. So then you can, I just have things that you can put them on keychains, or I just thought of the idea of um, putting a magnet on the back. I think that would be a really good idea. But I have a couple of examples of ones that I've made with clients. So I have this little heart, and mind you, they have been way more creative than I've been. But I made my kitty, but his tail fell off. It was supposed to be right here. But also, I find this, although it's not super like targeting towards a certain thing, I think I find for my clients that are kind of like hard shelled almost, I find that they are able to, we can coexist and kind of do this activity together and throughout the session they progressively kind of open up without like you know it's seeming like we're just talking and i'm asking them super targeted direct questions if that makes sense the conversation becomes more organic rather than forced and I find that kind of effective for my more shy clients or clients that, you know, kind of take a, a little bit of warming up to me. Um, so yeah, I they like this, they love this, they keep asking me to bring it back and I'm like, we can't just do melting beads every single time. But it's it's been super good. I've learned a lot, I've gotten a lot from them because of it. So yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining in on today's training. We look forward to having you join us again. Heart and Solutions is proud to provide CE eligible trainings for our counseling community. This training may be eligible for continuing education credit hours through either the National Board for Certified Counselors, provider number 7376, or the Association of Play Therapy, provider number 21-645. To obtain CE hours for today's training, be sure to follow the steps in the description below.